Welcome back to the Triathlon Training Explain Show, powered by Training Peaks. Now, if from time to time you are riding indoors, perhaps on a turbo trainer, as I am today, then you will have quite likely at some point complained that it feels somewhat harder or maybe considerably harder than when you ride outdoors. Your heart rate's higher, your power's lower, your FTP maybe feels a bit out of reach. What is going on? Well, you'll be pleased to know that you're definitely not alone. And today, I'm gonna to be exploring that conundrum. I'm gonna be looking at how it happens and what you can do about it. Now, I must admit, there have been times that I've jumped on the indoor trainer and I've wondered what the heck is going on with my legs. And it can really play with your head because efforts just seem so much harder to achieve, sometimes impossible, whereas normally you're knocking them out of the park when you're outside on the road. So what do we think is happening? Well, I've been out and I've asked you just that. Uh, why is it harder indoor training? Because you don't get any rest. You have to keep going all the time. You don't, you're not able to glide and uh, you have to keep within the zone all the way through, which, uh, which is much, much more difficult when you're out on the bike. The thing I find hard about indoor training is that there's no distractions. There's no changing gear, there's no steering, there's no needing to be aware of traffic. And so you really have to focus on the pain and how much it hurts. Uh, I think it's because of the heat, so you don't have the wind coming against you, cooling you down, so you can easily overheat, which can uh, see, make you feel like you're putting out a lot more effort than you actually are. <laughs> it's a definite love-hate relationship with the indoor trainer, and it makes training a lot harder. There's no freewheeling, coasting, um, sitting behind people. There's constant tension on the chain as you're pushing through the session. Well, there are some very good theories there, but let's see what the science says. Now, one theory is that it's due to a reduced cooling effect. See, the human body has quite a small and finite range it can efficiently operate in, and that's between 36.5 and 37.5 degrees Celsius. And this is what's considered our normal body temperature. Now, if we go just a fraction above that, we can start to feel a little bit off and actually our training, like cycling, might start to feel a bit more labored. Then if we just go about three degrees Celsius above, maybe to around 40 degrees Celsius, we can really start to feel quite bad and actually you can start to experience the onset of hyperthermia. Now obviously when we're cycling indoors, we are stationary, but our bodies are still creating vast amounts of this energy to power our legs and keep things working. So this is where things get really interesting because the cells within our body actually get the energy from food and then creating and using that through ATP molecules. And they are then used to make our body work and make our legs work and be able to cycle. But through this whole conversion, there's actually only an overall efficiency of around 25% that's actually used to make our legs work. The other 75% is, wait for it, it's lost through heat. So if you take a cyclist cruising along outside at around 30 kilometers per hour, they're experiencing a nice wind, a nice breeze, a bit of headwind. That's the equivalent of a big, big old fan at around 30 kilometers per hour, or perhaps even more depending on the conditions. But when we're riding inside, that headwind, that breeze, it's all gone. So you can start to understand how the body starts to feel the effects of this heat. And it starts to respond in a few ways. So firstly, we have a slight increase in our heart rate. Secondly, the blood starts to shunt and move away from our muscles in an attempt to dissipate the heat. So it goes towards our skin to try and relieve that heat out of our body. But through doing so, it's obviously taking oxygen away from our muscles. So then we might start to experience a slight loss in power. Another way it tries to dissipate the heat is through sweat. And in doing so, we can end up feeling slightly more dehydrated. And again, a loss in performance. And also as temperatures really rise, then our head and our brain literally cook, meaning it leads to a decrease in motivation, concentration, and perhaps even lowering our pain threshold. But of course we all know that that's why we use a fan. A fan is there to essentially recreate the wind, to try and keep us cool, to wick the sweat away from our skin and stop us from overheating. But what I would say is that I know from experience that I am pretty much always dripping with sweat when I get off an indoor training session, despite having a fan. So perhaps it does contribute 
in some way to making indoor training harder. Now another theory is that it's due to being in a fixed position. So without the ability to actually move the bike, we're causing ourselves to use more isolated muscles that perhaps aren't used to working quite so hard. See, when we ride outside on the road, we're able to shift our body weight around, get up out of the bike, move the bike around, and in turn, we can start using more muscle groups, even our upper body, our core, as well as obviously our legs to really help produce as much power as possible. And actually through doing that, we can allow some muscles to recover and rest whilst others are working to overall help to produce as much power as possible. Another thing athletes do complain about is that some muscles or certain areas of muscles might hurt, like, such as adductors coming up the inside of the leg. That's a real classic one because when we're riding outdoors, we don't tend to utilize and use those muscles quite so much, but they seem to get quite hammering when we're riding indoors and that can really contribute to slight loss in power. But what I would say is that with time when you're riding indoors, you will start to train those muscles up, condition them, get better at using them, and hopefully start to find it's slightly less of an effort. The indoor trainer also has the ability to suck the life out of even the most motivated of athletes. So if you're riding indoors, maybe in your garage, a dark garage next to your lawnmower and a bunch of tools, let's be honest, that is nowhere near as motivating as riding outside on the road on a clear sunny day. So if you're not as motivated, that is going to contribute to a loss in power. So what I would say is for indoor training, try and tailor your sessions specifically for indoor training. Keep them engaging, keep them interesting, keep that body guessing. Try to make them slightly shorter, more intense. Maybe don't do quite so many of the longer rides indoors, otherwise you are just going to mentally burn yourself out. Now on that note, also things like Zwift and other virtual indoor training platforms are great for keeping you interested and engaged in indoor training. But the big reason, I believe, comes from the indoor trainer itself, or at least from some indoor trainers. See, when you're cycling outside on the road and you stop pedaling, you coast, you just keep on going. But when you're inside on an indoor trainer, when you stop cycling, you pretty much come to a stop within seconds, or at least on some indoor trainers. See, what's happening is when you're outside, you have the momentum from your own body weight, your bike weight, and that just keeps you going so you can freewheel and you can come off the gas and coast. Whereas inside on an indoor trainer, you have a flywheel that's attached to the resistance unit. And what that flywheel tries to do is it tries to replicate that feeling of riding outside on the road. But from experience, and we all know this, it doesn't really do it that well. So what you're having to do is work harder to try and maintain that momentum. And because of this flywheel, it also changes the way that we apply force throughout the pedal stroke. So when we're cycling outside on the road, you may think that you're applying force evenly and smoothly throughout the whole pedal stroke. But in actual fact, what you're probably doing is applying force through the downstroke, and that is also aiding the recovery of the other leg back up to the top of the stroke and vice versa. But this all changes slightly when we start to go up a hill because we need to apply force throughout the whole pedal stroke to maintain that momentum. Otherwise, we'll either fall off our bike or fall back down the hill. And that is very similar to when we're riding on an indoor trainer due to that flywheel and that inertia that we've got to overcome on the flywheel and try and maintain that momentum. Now, all these factors are contributing to what's making it harder and considerably harder than when we ride out on a road where we've got minimal resistance from tires and wind, for instance. But fortunately, these issues are becoming less and less due to advances in the flywheels. We've got bigger flywheels on the dumb trainers. But most importantly, it's due to these smart trainers and direct drive trainer as I'm using today. So by taking the rear wheel out of the equation and now including this larger, heavier flywheel, a simulated rear wheel momentum is created. And when you stop now on a direct drive trainer, the 
flywheel continues to roll until that inertia is exhausted and all that contributes to a much more realistic feel. So whereas before you would feel that resistance on the bottom and the top of the pedal stroke, that is all gone and all that helps to allow you to produce very similar powers on the indoor trainer as you would outdoors. Now regardless of the type of trainer that you're using, add all those factors together and you can start to understand why some people find riding indoors that bit harder. So this brings us on to the big question. Should you be adjusting your functional threshold power or your FTP for riding indoors? And that is a very good question. So what I would say is if you're consistently riding around 10 watts below your usual power compared to when you're riding outdoors, then yes. But before you do that, just check on the accuracy of your power meter. See, some people, when they ride outdoors on the road, they'll use the power meter that's on their bike, and then when they ride indoors, they read the power from their smart meter, but they might be reading slightly differently. So just check on that, and also, obviously, do calibrate your power meters from time to time to really improve that accuracy. But back to the big question, and if you are heading indoors, and maybe for a considerable time for the winter, then definitely do an FTP test indoors to make sure that you're tailoring your zones around that FTP. So you're not working too hard when you're riding indoors or perhaps even too easy. And on the subject of riding too easy, you do need to make sure that you're retesting quite regularly with an FTP test. So I'd normally suggest every six weeks, but if you do find that you move on quite considerably, then obviously retest sooner. Well, with all that being said, if you train exclusively indoors and you're keeping yourself nice and cool and you're highly, highly motivated, then you may well not actually see any difference or very little difference between your power indoors versus outdoors. Some people just don't find they have a difference, but they are certainly the lucky ones. But hopefully what we have shown today is that it's not all in your head. It can actually be harder training indoors. And actually with these advances in the direct drive smart trainers, hopefully we'll see less of these complaints with time. Now, if you like this video, hit that thumbs up button. And if you'd like to see more from GTN, just click on the globe and subscribe. Now, if you'd like to see our how to choose an indoor trainer video, just click up here. And if you'd like to see our other indoor versus outdoor video, but this time for running, just click down there.